Welcome back. It's time for Silver and Black and Odyssey Sports original podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. And you have two guides along this path. Whether you dare to come down the path with us or not is up to you. And that is myself, Scott Branson, my co-host here. We are a partnership. It is both of us. We do it because we love you. Yes, we do. We love football too. But his name is Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer over at Bleacher Report. He's also the Raiders columnist on sportsnot.com. You can follow him at x.com at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N, if you dare. Also, you can follow me there at LV Gully. The show is SNB Today. You can also follow my work writing about the Raiders and other things like horse racing, whatever they throw at me over at sportsnot.com. You can also find it there as well. We're back talking Raiders football. And again, we want to uh, pass on our uh, condolences to, uh, of course, Jim Otto's family. Jim Otto passed away 86 years old. He is Mr. Raider. He was the first Raider and uh, an Oakland Raider, clearly, and just an amazing guy, an amazing life, an amazing player, and what he was able to do. And I, what I want to do right now before Mo and I start yapping is I want to I want to make sure we give we give uh, uh, Jim Otto some credit here, but also Mark Davis and the Raiders. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this video, but we're going to play it, or if you've heard it. But um, this was the video the Raiders put out after they found out about the passing of Jim Otto on Sunday. So here's that video. On the Raider Nation, I'm here at Allegiant Stadium to light the Al Davis Memorial Torch in honor of and tribute to Jim Otto, the original Raider. The entire Raider Nation's thoughts and prayers go out to Jim's wife, Sally, and the entire Otto family. Jim, may you rest in peace. All right, there you go. So uh, thanks to Raiders.com for that video. Uh, but there you go. So Jim Otto passed away at 86. And uh, Mo, this franchise so so historic in its past and what has happened. So many players, great ones. And, you know, unfortunately, the circle of life, uh, for you Lion King fans out there or anybody, is uh, we're starting to lose some of these guys more and more. And, of course, Jim Otto it goes now, but the old double zero, which of course you can't wear in the NFL. Now I saw some Raider fans online talking about they, I know the Raiders don't retire jerseys, but they should definitely retire double zero. Well, it technically is because you can't wear it in the NFL. Uh, but I do think that, you know, you look back at the start of this franchise, of course, uh, having Jim Otto there, what he was able to do and what he did after his time there being such a great champion of the organization and of charity and always being around these Raider guy, every person who's come through and played for the silver and black over the years since Jim Otto played his 15 years in the NFL. And of course he was inducted in the hall of fame in 1990. Uh, they've all been there. He's been there for all of them and they've all gotten to know him. So it's a big loss for Raider nation. Yeah. The, the thing I saw after the announcement of his passing is a lot of photos from Raider nation. A lot of people that we come in contact with have taken photos with him all over so he was very involved with Raider Nation and the fans very appreciative of the love that he got and deserved uh for what he did for the organization and for the game of football so rest in peace Jamato and a lot of people felt that one in their hearts uh, of course I was I wasn't even thought of being born when Jamato <laughs> was playing <laughs> I was born to the 80s so I got to go back and watch some old games with Jim Otto and understand what he meant to Raider football and how he personified the shield Yes, uh, I I could have watched him when I was a wee child. That's how old I am. Uh, so I'm sure I did at some point. Just don't remember it, obviously, because I was only four or five years old. But uh, yeah, and I would love, you know, I know the Raiders will either do a helmet to Cal or a patch or something this year in honor of Jim Otto. I have no doubt about that. I would love to see them all come out, even if it's just for warm-ups, in the old school two-bar helmets. I think that oh, would be a yeah. really cool a cool honor to him. They can't wear it during the game, obviously, because of NFL rules, but it would be cool to come out uh, for, for uh, warmups pregame uh, in week one to, with those, with those two uh, bar um, face masks on. So we'll see how it goes. But anyway, uh, and uh, just again, want to pass on our best to Jim Otto and a great job by Mark Davis and the Raiders. I thought that video was great uh, for them to get out there to the torch and light the torch for him. So good stuff. All right, let's get back to football. Now, Mo uh, OTAs begin in Henderson this week. And, uh, you know, I wrote a piece for 
sports knot that you can find in the description below as well about the Raiders OTAs and questions going into OTAs. Although I have to tell you, OTAs, you don't get a lot of answers. You do start to get some glimpses of things. And I, I listed in there, of course, the quarterback battle. I listed in there, of course, the offensive line, where it's going to end up and settle and gel. And then just understanding how Luke gets his offense, which is something, a subject here on this show, we spend a lot of time on and will spend a lot of time on in the future for these players to get in, get familiar with it, get familiar with one another in that environment. Uh, when you look at OTAs, Fans are excited just because the guys are out there and they have some content, they have some things to see. But overall, if you're a fan out there, Mo, for someone who covers the entire league like you do, what should people expect in these OTAs? What answers might they get and what shouldn't they look for? What they shouldn't look for is cemented positions. So at this time, coaches, staffs are trying players out at different spots to see where they fit best. So if you see a player or if you hear about a player lining up at right guard and he could also be right tackle don't get too caught up in oh he's lining up a right guard at otas because by by the time mandatory mini camp rolls around by the time training camp rolls around he could be at a different spot so they're going to cross train offensive linemen so don't get too uh wrapped up into where offensive linemen line up i will say the pecking order starts to matter a little bit you know if there's a guy who has an uncertain role in the depth chart is he lining up with the first stringers early is he lining up with the second stringers early because it could be an early indication of how the coach staff feels about that player's growth if it's a young guy so let's say Thayer, Thayer Mumford is practicing with the first stringers which we do expect I expect that to hold now if a guy like DJ Glaze is you know practicing with the first stringers that means he has a real legitimate shot maybe to start at right tackle if it is the right tackle position that he's practicing with. So just keep an eye on the pecking order, but don't write anything in pen yet. There you go. And no, I, I think that's, that's a good point because I think you start to see some of this also performance, you know, Oh, so-and-so got this long touchdown. Again, I think you have to take that with a grain of salt. Remember they're, they're going to be in shorts, shirts and helmets, right? Uh, and even some of that, they won't even have helmets on now. It's, it's, it's hot in Vegas. So uh, they'll spend some of their time indoors as well, depending if they go early in the morning. But I do think it's it's great. Again, as we talked about, for example, like when you had the rookies in uh, last week, it was sort of like that was that was when you go into your new job and you start yeah. and you come in for like orientation, right? So this continues the orientation. This just starts to introduce a little more, more of the football. And in the open sessions where you'll see pictures and video from where the media is present, they're not going to share a lot. You're not going to see a lot of the offensive scheme, even though they're going to start to introduce it to these guys so that by the time they get to mandatory minicamp, they, they have a sense for that. So I look at that, and I think you're right. I think the pecking order and, and, and how guys are doing. I also think this is another time when you see the Raiders look at uh, options they have and, and people they may need that they don't have still. I still think they're going to sign a veteran cornerback. I don't know who. We can talk about that. But I, I just think that there, there's some spots on this roster that they want to strengthen. They look good at wide receiver. They got veterans there. They got young guys there. I think they're good. But from a cornerback perspective, I think they still need to make some moves there as well. Uh, when you look at this team heading into OTAs as well, Mo, is that what you expect as well? You expect them to to sign another cornerback here and perhaps a couple other players, maybe even on the offensive side? I expect them to sign a cornerback, but I think part of OTAs too is that you get to familiarize yourself with the roster if you're the coaching staff. So mm. let's say the rookies, you know, Cameron, uh, Cameron Richardson, to Cameron Richardson, excuse me, and MJ Devonshire look good. They may they may wait a bit. They may say, yeah. "Oh, we may have something." Or Jacorian Bennett shows that he's made a leap from year one to year two. They may say, "Oh, we we may not need a veteran cornerback. We we may like the guys that we have." So I, I think it's also a first glimpse of what your roster looks like on the field. I know it's seven on sevens and eleven on eleven drills, but you could still kind of get a feel for if a guy has shown improvement. If you want, if you put him in an off season weight training program, how does he look on the field? Is he ready? uh physically to play you know a full slate mm -hmm. as a starter you get all of those looks early in otas and i think that's uh that's going to sort it out over the next couple of weeks yeah no doubt about it and i think you know what people forget about because he was out injured last year i'm not saying long-term answer but brandon face on is Faison. there too 
right? Mm-hmm. And he's got he's got that veteran experience. And so you start to think about him if he's fully recovered from that injury, he's 100% and he regains the form that he had. And of course, he was a Raider before and then he was in Houston, he came back. Um that also it that's comforting that you have a guy there. I'm not again, I'm not saying he's the answer, but you would expect him if fully healthy to compete for that role there, which is good for those young guys like Bennett, like you're talking about, like Richardson, as well as Devonshire, to have that veteran there to kind of compete with. And then past that, again, you want depth. So even if they do sign, maybe one of those guys wins out and then they still sign another veteran just for depth. Of course, they have to watch uh, the salary cap. They're not going to spend too much there, but I do believe that there's an opportunity there as well. Scott, I think the, also, oh, yeah, so, please. Sorry to cut you off, but don't oh, for, okay. also don't forget that Brendan Faison is also a former Chargers. So Tom Telesco apparently sees something, saw something in him then, and still sees something in him now. So he, he's got a shot to play this year. So, yeah. And Guyton on the other side of the ball, wide receiver, of course, a former Charger as well. That's going to happen whenever a GM who's got experience with a roster and drafted players over the year years. And he had 11, obviously, in Los Angeles slash San Diego. So he's got um, he's got the, the skinny on those guys. He likes those guys, knows their attitudes, knows how they fit. And so we'll, he, we'll see how he does that. By the way, on the offensive side, Mo, outside of offensive linemen, which it looks like they have a mix of guys that they want to work with and they're going to figure out. And like you said, OTAs will be a first opportunity to kind of slot some guys in and see what they have. Um, outside of that, though, we, we, we think they're pretty set at tight end, right? <laughs> Wide receiver room is full. And I was telling you, I was watching over the weekend as I was, I was researching this piece for Sports Not that I did on the Raiders OTAs. Um, this, this Ramel Keaton from, uh, Tennessee, man, I like this kid. Um, he dropped a bit in the draft cause he, he, his first two years were not great. He was a highly touted high school recruit, 6'3", 197 pounds, 4'4", 740. But I'm watching the film with this guy, Mo, and he averaged his last two years, 18 yards per reception. And he's got a knack in the vertical game, getting behind the defense. So again, uh, undrafted free agent. I'm not saying he's going to make the squad, but these are the kind of guys too that I watch for in OTAs to say, okay, did he show something enough that going into minicamp and going into camp, he's got some attention and the and the coaching staff and the front office are watching him and saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, it's just OTAs, but man, this kid works hard. He's got the ability. These are the kind of players that sometimes can peak up and, and make a name for themselves and really take a great shot, not guaranteed, but a great shot at trying to make the roster. And it starts now. Yeah, and not only that, he has an element that the Raiders need at wide receiver on the perimeter, and that's the speed that the Raiders, uh, I don't want to say desperately need, but don't have right now. Trey Tucker, as you remember, is mostly exclusively a slot wide receiver. So the Raiders have added a bunch of wide receivers, veteran and, and undrafted rookies, to kind of balance that on the perimeter with Devontae Adams, of course, who could play various positions at wide receiver, can line up inside, can line up outside, can line up on either side of the formation. And then you have uh, Jacoby Myers who can line up in the slot on the outside. So there's some versatility there. They just need the complementary speed and they can find that possibly in the, un- in the undrafted rookie. Yeah. You never know. And again, he's also got the size, you know, Devonte Adams is six one and, and built, I mean, he's a big dude, but six, three, almost 200 pounds uh, with the speed. Um, and so I would, I would recommend you guys go watch some of that film. Again, it's hard undrafted free agents, very difficult to make a roster, let alone play. Uh, so it's a long shot, but I like when I see a new GM bringing in guys like that too, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's in, it's enlightening to me because I could start to see a little bit about the fact that he sees the need there and maybe they didn't address it through the draft like they wanted to, or they couldn't because they had other needs. They try other ways and say, Hey, maybe, you know, we'll take a gamble on this kid played in the big conference, big size, all these great numbers his final two years just didn't capture the attention. So uh, I like seeing that from the Raiders because I, I feel like they've had players like that in the past, but I think with Telesco I've seen, and I've been impressed with some of his direction. You outlined it in your piece about his draft history, but when you look at some of the other pieces and the undrafted free agents he had in LA, quite a few that actually made the roster. Yeah, I'll bring up a few uh, right now. Austin Eckler, <laughs> Michael <laughs> Davis, the cornerback, Jalen Guyton, I believe, was undrafted. So yeah. there are some guys that he's picked up 
undrafted that you that I guess Charger fans are like, oh, well, this guy take a flyer on why not? And they turn out to be contributors. I mean, not necessarily outside of Austin Eckler, not necessarily headline guys, but guys who can start and, and give you a lot on either side of the ball. So I think there's a possibility that Tom Sesco continues that Raider pattern of finding maybe one or two contributors out of the undrafted rookie class. So I would keep an eye on, on these guys. We haven't dug into the undrafted rookie class very much on the show. We will during the summer as uh, the position battles shake out and who can make the roster. And I have a 50 minute depth chart show coming out on Bleacher Report at the end of May. So we'll talk about some of those undrafted rookies who could possibly sneak onto the back end of the roster. End of May. We're almost there, by the way. Yeah. It's It's crazy. Three months until the season starts, Mo? Three months and some days? I have it. Yeah. This little ticker yeah. I have behind me, if you're watching us on YouTube, it actually has a counter for the days until Raider kickoff. But, hey, it's coming quick. But we'll get into that. We hope to have some of those guys here on the show, too, working on some interviews. So stay tuned for that. All right. We're going to step aside for our first break. When we come back, we're going to talk a couple things, and then we're going to get into your calls. We've gotten so many calls, we, we've moved it. The Raider Nation mailbag, we used to just do it on Thursdays. Now we're going to do it each show as long as you're calling in. And, of course, we had the, the the schedule unveil last week. We had some of that, so we're going to talk about that, have your calls on that, as well as some of your calls on other subjects related to the Raiders. So stick with us. On the way out here, we're going to, again, uh, pay tribute to Jim Otto. So, uh, again, want to send out condolences to the Raider Nation family and to his family, the Otto family, and thank him for his contribution uh, everything he did for the Raiders and for the NFL. Again, Jim Otto passes away at 86, and uh, we will keep his family in our thoughts and prayers. Thanks. Welcome back to the home stretch here on Silver and Black today. That's right. This is the Tuesday edition, getting towards Labor Day weekend, excuse me, Memorial Day weekend. And this is my annual lecture, Mo. I have to get on my soapbox for one second. And that is Memorial Day versus Veterans Day. It's the <laughs> difference, right? I have a lot of friends who are veterans. My grandfather, a World War II veteran. I am a member of the Sons of the American Legion. Lots of friends who served in the military. Shout out to all my buddies, including Josh, Irv, all the guys who and, and Chris, uh, who all served in the military. But remember, Memorial Day is about those that served and died, gave their life for the country. Veterans Day is for all veterans. Alive, doesn't matter, passed away, uh, you remember them. So just remember that. Memorial Day. I know we all have barbecues and all that kind of stuff, but it really is a somber occasion and just remember all the men and women who gave their lives so that you and I can have the freedoms that we have, including climbing on YouTube and talking about football and also being a Odyssey Sports original podcast, too. So remember that. And do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the audio version wherever you get your audio. And if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe and the notifications bell. All right, Mo, we're back. We're talking Raiders football. And I want to start with this, too, because... You know, Mo is Midtown Mo. He's beloved. Um, I hear it all the time here on the YouTube channel, how much people love your your work, your attitude, all that kind of stuff. Well, last show, we did your first breakdown of the schedule where you gave your early results of based on the schedule. Again, before camp, before rosters are final, any of that stuff. And looking at the league as you do, because that's the key here. I think one thing is, a lot of us, like, for example, I'll use my own fandom. I'm a, a Vegas Golden Knights fan. So I know a little bit about the NHL, but I really follow the Pacific Division and, and the conference, the Western Conference, because that's where the Golden Knights are. I don't pay a lot of attention. So like, okay, the Rangers did well. You're in New York. You know, by the way, sorry about the Knicks. You did well. <laughs> you did well. The New York Rangers, all the stuff, all Boston, all, like, I don't really pay attention to them until they get in the playoffs. So I, I'm not I'm not real well versed in it. You are well versed in the entire league because that's your job. You don't just cover the Raiders; you cover the entire league. So your predictions came out, and there were a lot of our listeners and and folks that follow you online who disagree with you. Nothing wrong with that. Hey, I, I have some Raider fans tell me they're going to win 11 games. Fine, 
nothing wrong with being optimistic, especially as a fan. Uh, but then I had we had people who really, really were upset. <laughs> I guess that's the word I'll use. Upset about your prediction. We got better. How could we have the same record as last year? Which we can get into that in a second. But it was it was interesting because you know we interact with people all the time, and some people listen to this show and they get mad when we talk about those interactions. But I'm sorry, I don't care because our, without our listeners, we don't have a show. And so when they talk to us, we talk about that because we care what they think and we like to have a dialogue with them. But were you surprised at some of the reaction or were you expecting that obviously because Raider Nation seems to be very high on where the team is going and then you have some media that's pretty negative and then you have most of us, I think, who are in the middle of like, hey, you know what? Yeah, they got better, but so did the rest of the league. Anytime I don't predict the Raiders to win 10 or more games and go to the playoffs, I expect that reaction. <laughs> and I expect the reaction because as a fan, you're supposed to be optimistic for your team. No one, no Ooh. fan goes, wants to go into a season thinking their team is not going to make the playoffs and finish under 500. That's just not a fun experience as a fan. So I, I totally understand it and I don't get mad at it. And this is mm -hmm. why I don't respond to a lot of it because I know where it comes from. It comes from a fan perspective of, I want my team to be good. And there are some people out there with legitimate reasons of why they think the Raiders will win 10 or more games. And I respect that. But at the same time, on my end, I, I just like they disagree with me. I disagree with them. And disagreement is fine because I don't I don't like I said, I don't because there's some vitriol that comes to, toward me because of it. And there's some respectful disagreement. I don't respond to any of it because it's May and there are things that could. <laughs> happen injuries happen trades could happen that could change that's why i usually call it my initial prediction right it's subject to change based on what happens around the league if a quarterback goes down that the Raiders are supposed to play it, it may change my prediction for example if you know the Raiders are scheduled to play the Bengals, if joe burrow is hurt again then i'll say well the raiders probably win that game <laughs> because <laughs> joe burrow is out you know so there are some things that could change that prediction it's initial uh, projection for me if it doesn't change and it stays eight and nine i'm i'm fine with that because last year i said i said seven and ten and people disagree with me i said seven and ten and people disagree with me both ways there were people who hopped on my bleacher report live and said there's no way the raiders win six games like a lot of people came in our show and said the raiders don't win six games right and there are some people that said no the mo the raiders gonna win 10 games they're gonna figure it out and you know like i said i don't unless somebody comes at me i don't pull out the receipts for those people and try to embarrass them because every year there are fans that want to be optimistic and i respect that um so I, it is what it is uh if you're not going to be positive at this point in the off season people tend to disagree with you and you just have to live with that as a writer because that's the reality of it it is and and to your point i think that there's there's definitely an argument for uh for disagreeing with an eight win projection and and it's funny because I see people. Well, it's too early. You, the, the, I, these are ridiculous. Why are you even predicting what they're going to do? You have, they haven't even been to camp yet. Okay, but then those same people express that they think they'll win more games. So you're going around in the same way. And listen, the reality is this time of the year. Yeah, it's the slower time of the year. So what are we going to do here? We're going to talk about things that I think are of interest to the audience. And that includes, as you know, because you did it on, you unveiled that on a Bleacher Report Live, which was, again, a huge success, completely socked in with people talking to you. So people are interested in it. it I understand when people aren't interested in it. Like I've had some, some of our listeners say, hey, you know what? I don't listen to you guys a lot in the off season. It's no offense, love the show, but I'm just kind of checked in when the season's around and I'm checked out when it's not totally get that, understand it and respect it. You have things to do with your day. At the same time, there's people who want to talk about and, and, and discuss the Raiders in every possible way, every day they can. So that's what we do. So we figure we're going to produce content, not just because we want to produce it, but because we believe that's what the audience wants to hear. Some of you don't. We had comments on the YouTube page. Um, people said they are not subscribing to the channel anymore because in essence mo predicted that they would go eight and nine okay <laughs> then definitely not the show for you and that's okay i have no problem no animosity not mad at you but yeah if you if you want to hear that and i think it gets to something we've talked about on the show and people will lecture me not to talk about it because it's not football 
But that is, we can't disagree anymore. People don't want to disagree in a healthy way. We can disagree. I could say, hey, Mo, I think they're going to win 10 games. You say they're going to win eight. I can argue my point. You can argue your point. And we can walk away in front, from it and say, hey, okay, well, eventually one of us will be right or close to being right. And one of us will be wrong. And at that time, you can come back and you can say, hey, man, I told you. Here's why I thought. But it doesn't have to be antagonistic. It doesn't have to be a negative. It doesn't have to be I'm taking my ball and going home. So when people do that, I'm like, hey, great. We're not for you. The show's not for you or the discussion is not for you. And there's plenty of places you can go. And it's a complete cheerleader thing. And nothing wrong with that. There's sites that do that. Sites that don't. They're fan sites. And they're very optimistic. Our good buddy Murph, he's one of our best friends. We love him. He has a more optimistic outlook. That's good. But he does it in a way that's great. So we're never going to give you something that's not authentic. And if the, the non-authentic approach is what you're looking for, then you can find it. It's not a big deal. And we don't take offense at it uh, anymore. So that's it. But Mo was taking heat, which is so unusual. It's sort of like somebody screaming at Santa Claus. You know what I mean? It's like he it, gives. Scott, he gives and gives and gives. And then you yell at him. Scott, it, it actually is common. I mean, this, like oh, I, I said, a, a, anytime that I'm not predicting 10 wins in the playoffs, that, that usually happens. It's, it's the expected reaction. What's, what's interesting, though, is I did a bunch of pieces. Uh, obviously, we're in the middle of the Triple Crown stuff for horse racing. So for Sports Knot, I did one on the Kentucky Derby. Then I did Preakness. And part of that, I did lists, right? And lists are always tough because you're ranking all-time greats. And there's always going to be disagreement about that. I don't care what sport it is. And so it was, it was like all-time greats to win the Preakness. And I based that based on the horses. And I had people, same thing. Oh, I disagree. Why isn't so-and-so in here? Now, some of them were easy to say, hey, because I go in and I discuss it with him, uh, you know, in a very nice manner. And I said, well, great horse, but he didn't win the Preakness. Oh, yeah, that was the Kentucky Derby. Okay. And then other people just disagree with that, uh, with the order. And that's cool. Like, nothing wrong. I mean, as a writer, too, or as a host here on a podcast, we're going to give you opinion based on research and what we've done, the work we've put in. Doesn't mean we're always right or we're the be-all, end-all. So uh, we we appreciate disagreement and we appreciate you guys having the discussion with us. So thanks for that. All right. You with that good with that, Mo, or you got anything else to say? Good luck oh. to the Raiders this season. I'm not a <laughs> hater, despite the uh, what the people say. Good luck to the Raiders this offseason. Yeah. Season. My last thing is that whole hater term. If you don't agree with somebody, does not make you a hater. <laughs> right? If I went on for 15 minutes every show about how Antonio Pierce sucks, then I'd be a hater. Of course, we don't believe that here, but nonetheless... This hater term, man, I, I'm so stuck on the language. Anyway, that's my problem. I'll deal with it on my own. All right, we're going to get to your calls now here on the Raider Nation mailbag, uh, including one from Pastor Mike, who has a correction for me. Yes, occasionally, I know you guys, you know I'm hardly ever wrong. I'm kidding. Uh, and, and never misspeak on a show, because when you do shows, you never misspeak. You're perfect broadcaster. Not true. <laughs> But anyway, so Mike's got a correction for me, which I will take. He's a man of God doing God's work behind bars. So I'll take that. But first, we're going to go to our good buddy, Tarek, who we didn't have on the last show. I don't know. Did we? I can't remember. He is this week in Chicago. He called us from Chicago. He actually sent me some pictures. He texted me some pictures. He was at a card show or something. Bo Jackson was there. Bijan Robinson, he was having a good old time, acting like a big kid, so good for him. But here's Tarek with our first call of the day. Good evening, Scott and Mo. This is Tarek uh, checking in with you guys from Chicago. Uh, hope you guys are well this weekend. I uh, just want to talk a little bit about the schedule. First and foremost, I want to say how I love that both of you guys keep it real. Uh, passionate Raider fans, as we all are, uh, you got to put realism and objectivity uh, above the passion. I personally think that double digit wins is going to be a tall order. Um, I'm going to give the Raiders nine wins and I don't think we get to the playoffs. I think a lot of fans are just restless for winning seasons and playoff appearances and just, you know, waiting for us to actually turn the corner to where a consistent winner. Um, and, you know, we're all just waiting for that to happen. And I think we're on the right track. I just don't think we're there yet. Um, I think uh, when you talk about the quarterback position, whenever, the Raiders play quality quarterbacks and quality defenses. I think the glaring weaknesses will come out with whether it's um, AOC or Minshew at quarterback. Uh, we still don't know what we have at running back. We don't know if Zemir answers the white. Zemir White is the answer at running back. Uh, we don't know what Madison's going to bring to the table. Um, 
I think uh, Amir Abdullah is strictly a special teams player. I think that's where his only value really is. Historically, we've been really, really poor on the East Coast, and I believe about 25% of our games this season will be on the East Coast. Uh, what do you guys think? Um, tell me what you think with regards to my prediction of nine wins, but I, that is my win total. I don't think the Raiders are a playoff team this, this upcoming season. I do think that we will finish second or third in the division. I do predict Denver will be last. Um, you guys are doing a fantastic job this off season. I hope you have a great weekend. I'm looking forward to the content of your shows this week. Uh, and I will talk to you guys later. Go Raiders. Bye bye. All right, there's Tarek from Chicago this week, traveling on business as he does. Mo, what do you think of that? Tarek, be careful. They're gonna put you in the hater category with me. You're you're very you're too close to me at eight and nine, Tarek. You got nine and eight. I got eight and nine. I agree with you. Uh, I, I think it'll be Chiefs and then Chargers, Raiders, Raiders, Chargers in some order. I had Chargers at nine and eight. I had Raiders at eight and nine, simply because I feel like the Chargers have a much easier schedule. So when people say, hey, Mo, how could you predict us to have the same amount of wins, as, same number of wins as last year when we improve the roster? And the answer for me is pretty easy. You don't play the same schedule as you did last year, and you have to pay attention to what other teams are doing, what their schedule uh, has for them. So the Chargers, if you look at their schedule, as I explained on the X, the Chargers are going to play other fourth-place teams because they finished fourth place last year. The Raiders yes. are going to play other second-place teams because they finished second place in the division last year. That matters. <laughs> that matters when you do these season predictions because that means the Chargers theoretically are going to have an easier schedule. Now, there are teams every year that are finished fourth and then finished second or first the following year. But if you look at the teams the Chargers are going to play, it's teams that are a lot of rebuilding teams. And the Raiders, clearly to me, the Raiders have a tougher schedule. So that, that gets baked into my season prediction. So, Tarek, I'm, I'm in the same boat with you. You have them at 9 and 8. I have them at 8 and 9, missing the playoffs. And it's not simply because the Raiders didn't improve. It's because of who they're playing. And as I said, Raiders 4-1 under Antonio Pierce when they played back quarterbacks who are now backups this season. Now, Patrick Mahomes is the exception. The Raiders did beat Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. They do get credit for that. I'm not discrediting the Raiders' wins last season. But what I'm saying is when you when you play 4-5 or win 4-5 games against now backup quarterbacks, what are the chances you're going to play four backup quarterbacks in, in the consecutive years? It usually doesn't happen. So mm -hmm. the schedule naturally is going to be tougher for the Raiders. Now, people are going to say, well, Mo, the Raiders had a rookie fourth-round quarterback themselves. And I say, you're right. But then take that rookie quarterback from the fourth round, and you still have him as your starter, and now you're going to play against starting caliber quarterbacks or upper echelon quarterbacks. What is the result going to be? Because if you didn't significantly upgrade, but the other team did at quarterback, it's going to be a lot harder for you. Again, so I'm not discrediting the Raiders' wins last season. What I'm saying simply is the schedule is going to be harder simply because if quarterbacks are healthy, it's going to make it hard on the Raiders to win those games. So what I heard, Mo, just to repeat back, is that uh, Antonio Pierce is no good. They don't have a good quarterback. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. This is the responses you get from that statement, though, because I agree with yep. you. And I was going to make that point, which is also you can't, argue, you can't argue with who they played. They played backup quarterbacks to say, well, yeah, they played backup quarterbacks, but we played with an uh, offensive uh, play caller who never called plays and a quarterback. It doesn't matter. Like that doesn't, they're not the same thing. You can't compare it. it does, like you said, you don't take away the credit from Antonio Pierce or the Raiders for winning the games they won. Because you play who you play. You have no control of the fact that you're playing a backup quarterback. But it is a data point you have to consider going into the schedule this year if they don't have a run like that. Now, the other thing, too, to remember, you talked about the Chargers. The Chargers also, if you think about the last two years, how many games they lost because of just brutal coaching, okay? Now you have Jim Harbaugh. They might have less talent. I haven't looked at their roster to, to know as much. I need to go deeper on it. But what I'm saying, though, is everybody, the Raiders got better, but then there are other teams, and I do believe the Raiders are going to finish second in the, in the, in the conference, excuse me, in the, in the division. But the, I think the Chargers will be right there, too, and with the Broncos holding up the bottom. So, so it could go either way, and, and you don't know what happens. Injuries, freak stuff, you know, whatever happens, happens. But I do think that you have to be realistic – because I, I think if you if you over promise or if you over over optimistic, you're going to be let down for disappointment versus if you say, hey, nine, 10 wins, I see nine or 10 wins. Great. 
So if they win nine, you're okay. If they win six, not happy. If they win 10, awesome. So yeah, so I think you look at that and you have to look at the rest of the league and see, by the way, that the AFC is a freaking battle, right? I'm not talking about the division. I'm talking about the entire AFC. When you talk about making playoffs and then the schedule, the Chargers do have the most travel, by the way. So there is some, some trap doors for them, perhaps. But uh, good call, Tarek. I appreciate it very much. All right. Now we go to Raider Dog. Raider Dog's out in eastern Washington in the 509. Here we go. Hi, this is Raider Dog out of the 509. Yeah, I, repeat, I appreciate your honesty uh, on your schedule prediction. Uh, I do disagree a little bit uh, simply because I think Atlanta in prime time, Kirk Cousins always seems to choke in prime time, at least all the times I've watched him when he was uh, with the Vikings. Uh, so I strongly believe that that's a winnable game. And then I also think between Tampa Bay, Los Angeles, uh, and uh, Pittsburgh, I think one of those three games, I think there's a good, strong possibility that the Raiders will sneak out a win on one of those. Uh, not sure which one. I just got a feel that one of them, they'll, they'll sneak out a win on it. And because uh, I think they're as good as those teams are, uh, it's, you know, be a different story if they're playing them at home. Uh, so one of them, I believe Pittsburgh, they are. But at any rate, uh, my point is, I think they'll sneak out a win there, so that puts them up to 10 wins. And, uh, yeah, that's what I'm going with right now. And uh, it may get stronger after preseason or it may get a little weaker after preseason. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, that's my thoughts. Have a good day. All right, Raider Dog from the 509, man. We appreciate it. And, Mo, that's a great – great. see, there's a great example of somebody who disagrees with your prediction, your early prediction. Uh, but he laid it out for you, and it's plausible. Right. So, like I said um, – I have the Raiders losing to the Falcons, but I don't I don't deem it as a non-winnable game. So no. when I predict a, a loss, it doesn't mean that the Raiders can't win that game because there are a lot of uh, disagreements with me, like Raider Dog, like Raider Dog said with the Falcons. There were some disagreements with me and against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers where I had the Raiders losing. And I think I said this on the show, and I, if not, I did say it multiple times on the Bleach Report Live that I feel like the Raiders' ceiling is ten wins. And if they do get two more wins than I predicted, the Bucks and the Falcons game were the two games that I predicted would swing the other way. Right. Simply because Raider Dog mentioned Kirk Cousins' record on Monday Night Football, which is accurate. It's not usually not very good on Monday Night Football. So that's a valid point. <laughs> and the other the other part of it is with the Tampa Buccaneers, they have a one-dimensional offense. They had a one-dimensional offense with their former offensive play caller in uh, Dave Canales, who's now the head coach of the Panthers. They were last to Tampa Buccaneers in rushing last year. So when you are you have a one-dimensional offense, you make it easier for a, a decent defense. And the Rams had a top-10 score defense last year to defend you. So if the Buccaneers don't figure out their run game, the Rams can also win that game. So when I, again, so just to repeat, if I predict a loss, it doesn't mean it's not a winnable game for the Raiders. Sure. I just have it going the other way. But I, I, I respect the point that Raider Dog made about Kirk Cousins in, in primetime football Monday nights because that's been a struggle for him. Uh, at week, I believe they played in week 15. I said this to just win Wendy on the X. I think that's going to be a big game for both teams simply because I think the Falcons will be vying for a division title. And I think the Rays at that point will still be in the race for a playoff run. Uh, if they if they're even close to 500. So it, it could be a big game that could go either way. I don't disagree with Raider Dog's point, uh, but we'll see. We'll see how it turns out. We'll see how Kirk Cousins looks with a new team, a new uh, offensive play caller and those weapons. I do the point I made on sports not when I made my game by game predictions where I went more into the analysis of why I chose win or loss for each game is if the Raiders don't address their boundary cornerback position we talked about it in the first segment i think that could be a problem when you talk about having to defend drake london and darnell mooney on a perimeter mm -hmm. that's that's a weakness that i think that the falcons can exploit if the raiders don't address the cornerback position good stuff and raider dog appreciate the call man uh we'll talk to you next time all right now we go to pastor mike who's got a correction for me so i'm gonna apologize to him for getting location wrong but here's pastor mike yo scott mo Pastor Mike from Behind Bars. Hope you're doing well today. I'm doing pretty good. It's nice and sunny outside today. Scott, I do got to correct you because you said I'm from California. I actually work in Oregon, and I actually live in Boise, Idaho. So just uh, just a little clarification there. But <laughs> looking forward to the schedule. And the schedule's come out. I'm looking forward to 
to plan in my games because I'm traveling from so far away. I don't go to all the games, but I'm excited about it. Um, it's a little miffed. We only got two primetime games. But, you know, hey, I understand this, that the NFL doesn't like to see their star quarterbacks get smashed in primetime. <laughs> so they're not going to put the Raiders on as much because our defense is going to smash quarterbacks all year long. That's what I believe. So um, I want to also comment on on uh, Mo's take on, on the 8-9 and nine record. Now, I am a homer. I do have to say that. I am a Raiders purist. I look at we should go seventeen and zero every year. And so I think um I think Mo is actually I think he's probably pretty accurate, but what it really boils down to is two things. And I think you've touched on it. It it boils down to the quarterback play and it and, and the offensive coordinator. And um so I, I agree with you. Um, I still think the Raiders probably win more than that. I think they can win 10 to 11 games. Um, I would disagree with you. I think they beat the Steelers, and I think they sweep the division. Um, I don't think they split games with anybody this year. I think they're going to sweep the division. So that's a bold take, definitely. Um, and then I think the Miami game could go either way because looking back last year, we, when we came, went into Miami, it was under AP's tutelage and – and um, and that um, offensive coordinator or, you know, the play caller, um, you know, which was so vanilla, it was a close game. And so I think that that game can go either way. Um, otherwise, I think, yeah, you're, you're pretty much accurate, but it all depends on what Getsky can do um, with the weapons that he has and if our quarterback play is up to par. I think our defense definitely improved, and I think you're going to see real physical – um, beat him up style. So, and I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait, man. I'm, I'm excited <laughs> and I'm stoked to get down to see the games. So anyway, that's my take. You guys um, can comment how you want to comment. Um, that's fine. And I um, just want to say, Hey, have a great week and we'll talk to you next time. Raiders. There's Pastor Mike working in Oregon, living in Idaho. I got it. Pastor Mike, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate your call. Uh, Mo, hey, I mean, he, listen, again, another guy who disagrees, he, but to be fair, he said, hey, I'm a fan. I, I think they can win 10 or 11 games, laid out the reasons why. His concerns are our concerns, quarterback play and offensive coordinator, right? And I would say even if the Raiders drafted Jaden Daniels, let's say, and they had a good rookie quarterback you thought was going to be their franchise guy for a long time, I'd still have the same feeling because he'd be a rookie with a new offensive play caller who hasn't developed a quarterback. I would feel the same. I wouldn't, I would, I don't think I would feel exactly the same. I, I would, I get what you're saying that there's still questions because we don't know what that rookie quarterback can do or what he's going to be on the pro level. So there are going to be questions there. Is it going to be good right away? Is it going to take a year? I would feel more optimistic about the Raiders' future if they had one of those young quarterbacks <laughs> yes. in the first round. But I will to get to Pastor Mike's call, respectable call. And those are the type of disagreements that I like to have the, the back and forth banter. As I said on the exits, it's, it's kind of like sitting at a bar or restaurant and asking a friend, Hey, what do you think about the Raiders this offseason and what this season? And one person says, Hey, eight and nine. One person says, I, I think they can go eleven and six. And they talk about it. And they talk about their reasons why. And that's what we're doing here on the show. That's I it. had my I had my platform last week, and the fans get to respond and have uh their platform this week on what they think. And to Pastor Mike's point, he shares the he shares the concern that I have about the quarterback play caller combination. So Scott, I don't know if you remember this, but last year when this Raiders signed Jimmy G, a lot of people said they, a lot of people came at me last offseason and said, Mo, Jimmy G is a winner. We're gonna win more games than we did with Derek Carr under Josh McDaniels because Jimmy G is a winner. We saw it in San Francisco. He's been to a Super Bowl, and now he's got Devontae Adams. He didn't have a Devontae Adams in San Francisco. And what did I tell those people? I said, Jimmy G under Kyle Shanahan is not going to be the same Jimmy G under Josh McDaniels. The play caller matters. Having a quality play caller can elevate your offense just like having a average to below average play caller can hinder your offense. And I'm not saying Luke Getze is Josh McDaniels when it comes to play calling, <laughs> but he has a lot to prove. He he didn't have – I understand Justin Fields deserves some of the blame for the way the Bears passing game went south in Chicago, but Luke Getze bears some of the blame too. 
And all I'm saying is that Luke Getze has a lot to prove. And I'm not going to say because Gardner Minshew played well with the Colts under Shane Steichen that he's going to look the same under Luke Getze. Let's remember when Shane Steichen was the offensive coordinator of the Chargers, Justin Herbert broke rookie passing records. When Shane Steichen was the offensive coordinator of the Eagles, Jalen Hurts was an MVP candidate, and the Eagles won the Super Bowl with a top-scoring offense. Shane Steichen was in Indianapolis last year. He lost running back Jonathan Taylor for seven games. He had some injuries all over his offense. He lost his starting quarterback in Anthony Richardson early in the season, had to change his game plan from Anthony Richardson to Garner Minshew, who are two very different quarterbacks. And guess what? The Colts still finished top 10 in scoring with a bottom five, bottom six defense. So Shane Steichen is one of the top play calls in the league. People don't recognize him like Kyle Shanahan because he's only been a head coach for one year, Shane Steichen. But let me tell you, his work with Justin Herbert, his work with Jalen Hurts, his work with Gardner Minshew doesn't go unnoticed by people who follow him and follow his career. And I don't put Luke Getze up there with Shane Steichen when it comes to play calling. And that is my concern. That is my concern for the Raiders offense. He hasn't had the success. And, you know, Shane Steichen, of course, is is been so good because he's a UNLV Rebel, but I put that aside <laughs> for a second. Uh, but no, you're you're absolutely right, and I think that you you have to look at that. And and I I still go to Mo to the the Bill Walsh view. The Bill Walsh view going back the great Bill Walsh is yes, receivers help a quarterback, but a quarterback has much more to do with the success of a receiver than vice versa. OK, so you can have Devonte Adams, you can have Jacoby Myers, you can have Michael Mayer, you can have Brock Bowers. If your quarterback and your play caller can't get the ball to them in a way that ignites the offense, then it's going to it's going to be a struggle. It's just it, it's proven out. You, you can have teams that have great wide receivers and the quarterback play is subpar and you see they don't get the ball. The play calling could be off as well. So so I agree with you on that one. And and we have to wait and see. We don't know what Luke Getz is going to be like as a Raider coach. So we'll see. But it is a question mark, and, and it makes sense for that. So I appreciate it. And I appreciate Pastor Mike bringing that up, too, because we've been talking about it a lot here, too, as well. So there you go. Pastor Mike, thanks for the call. We now go to our final call of this show, of the mailbag. It is Isaac from Stockton, California. Here's Isaac. This is Isaac calling from Stockton, Northern California. My question is, any word, any scoop on the Raiders quarterback coach in case anything happens where it doesn't work out with Getsy? I'm curious if Mo or Branson have any scoop on his background on it and on his potential of taking over play calling duties. I'm curious also because comes from the Niner staff, and I think Pierce did a pretty good job of pegging them or whoever it was that chose him. Thank you. There you go. So, Isaac, thanks for your call. Of course, the Raiders hired um, Rich – God, why am I – oh, Rich Scangarello. Scangarello. Excuse me. Get it out there. He's an Italian guy. Um, of course, he was the former Broncos offensive coordinator, and he was at the University of Kentucky. He worked in the offseason, if I remember correctly, with Caleb Williams as a, as a quarterback coach. Uh, but he was the offensive coordinator at Kentucky uh, in 2022 and um, was fired after the end of that season. Of course, Will Levis was there that final year that he was there. Mo, w- what about thoughts there? I mean, I, I think it's hard. The question marks about Getze makes sense, but to start to think about what if he doesn't work out and he gets fired, I don't think Luke Getze, unless things are just so particularly awful, which I just can't imagine, um, getting fired midway through his first season with the Raiders. Right, I don't see I don't see Getsy getting fired midway through his first season with the Raiders unless it's, it's it has to be an absolute disaster, right? Yeah, <laughs> he gets fired. I think they at least give him a year. But to get to Isaac's uh, question from the voicemail, what about Rich Gangarello and what you know? What is his track record like? He doesn't have much of a track record as an offensive player card outside of that one year, that one full year in Denver where he worked with Drew Locke. And that's one of the reasons why I had Drew Locke as maybe being on the Raiders radar because he worked with Rich in Denver. But Scangarello has doesn't have a really good track record. He's been no. fired multiple times in the past few years. He can't he, he hasn't been able to keep a job for more than two seasons. Uh, he only spent two years, I believe, in San Francisco on their staff. Had one year, as you mentioned, in Kentucky. Had one year in Philly. Had one year in Denver. 
he hasn't been able to hold out a job. And maybe that's why he's not an offensive coordinator now, college or pro, and why he's a quarterback's coach. So I, if the Raiders were to, for some reason, let go of Luke Getze and elevate Rich, I would be, I would, I would still be concerned. I would be just as concerned, if not more concerned, about Scangarello than I would be Getze. Yeah, and Scangarello, too, when he was the Broncos' offensive coordinator, they finished 28th in the league in total offense. So to your point about not having a great record and and why he's there as quarterback coach, you know, that's, that's whatever Luke Getze, whatever – uh, Antonio Pierce saw in him for, you know, some guys are good in certain positions. And so maybe, maybe that's his role and his role will be a good one there. I know he did coach, obviously he was in San Francisco. He coached Jimmy Garoppolo when Garoppolo had success. And again, that's not play calling. That's just quarterback coach. They don't necessarily have responsibility over that. It's just to keep the quarterbacks on target and keep moving. So we'll see how it goes. But Isaac, man, appreciate your call from Stockton the home of the University of Pacific Tigers, as a matter of fact. But thank you, man, for calling in and for being part of the show. That's going to conclude the mailbag for this week. Mo, uh, here we are on a Tuesday. Of course, we're going to be watching what's happening out in Henderson at workouts for OTAs. But uh, let everybody know what you got coming up this week so they can keep track of you, whether it be on Bleacher Report, Sports Not, or Bleacher Report Live. Well, I'll take a look at some of the – I'll take an early look at some of the positions that are going to be up for grabs during the Raiders off season over on sports, not so I won't necessarily maybe not predict winners of positions yet because it's, it's early. I'll just break down some of the contenders for some of the starting starting spots that are uncertain right now. So we'll, we'll get through some of the names, what they bring to the table and possibly how the pecking order could turn out by the time we hit training camp. Other than that, I'm not on bleach report live until the next week, next Wednesday, I'll go over the depth chart on who can make the fit, final 53 man and who could be mm. uh, maybe on the practice squad, who could sneak on the roster. Maybe can the Reds make a trade or two that may surprise us? Who knows? Because there's a lot of movement even before we uh, the NFL teams finalize their rosters. We see trades every year. Guys are going to get cut around June 1. Guys are going to get added around June 1. So a lot of movement to come. Uh, it's a bit of a lull, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some good content out on Sports Night. Just look out for that. All right, there you go. See? So make sure you check out sportsnot.com. Check out Mo, of course, on x.com at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. And his stuff is up there. And we always tweet that out. I tweet it out. He tweets it out. It goes out from the SNB Today account as well, uh, all the work that we do uh, on the various websites. So make sure you check that out. It's also be in the description. We add it when we have it. And I even go back and add it post in case you're watching the show late. Uh, but make sure you do that. We're going to be back on Thursday with another show. Next week, of course, is Memorial Day on Monday, as we mentioned, top of the show. So we will uh, we will be off next week uh, sans any big news surrounding the Raiders. So just a heads up on that one. But we will get you a show on Thursday as well. Don't forget, if you haven't done so already, uh, make sure you call in and be part of the show. And I'll flash the the, the number up there for those watching, 702 900 7869. That's 702 900 7869. Leave your voicemail for us to get on Thursday's show, and we'll get to you during the Raider Nation mailbag, as always. So, thank you for doing that. All right, uh, Mo, have a good one, man. And we will talk to you Thursday, and then we're going to enjoy a nice long weekend next week, hopefully, uh, and, and get some downtime. I think I'll go back into my uh, New York cave and go into my dark <laughs> retreat mode again. There you go. That's that's what you'll do. And uh, stay off those interwebs and, and and let people argue with each other without you being in the middle of it. No, I'm just kidding. It's all good. All right. So, folks, do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio. If you're watching us on YouTube, thank you again. Hit the subscription button and that notifications bell. That way you know every time we have a new video or when we go live. So thank you for that. For our producer, Mike Robbie over at Odyssey, for Mo Moten, I am Scott Goldbranson. This has been Silver and Black today. Everybody have a great week. Have a great weekend. If we don't talk to you before then, or if you don't check into the show on Thursday, and we will continue talking Raiders football next time. Thanks for being with us. All right. <laughs>